Hey everyone, Chuck Arfine here. This is the White Sox Talk Podcast brought to you as always by our friends at Wintrust. Okay, the free agent market got flooded on Wednesday with almost 60 players getting non-tendered, including Carlos Rodon and Nomar Mazzara. Plus, a couple of big names that could be interesting fits with the White Sox. I'm talking Eddie Rosario and Kyle Schwarber. So on the podcast, love the fallout from these moves and how they might affect the White Sox as they look to make upgrades in right field and DH. We'll also hear from new White Sox bench coach Miguel Cairo and hitting coach Frank Manichino, who may have provided the quote of the offseason so far. It's all coming your way on the White Sox Talk podcast in a moment. White Sox, White Sox, go, go, White Sox. That ball hit deep, way back, deep to the field. Holy cow, Carlton Fisk has put the White Sox ahead. Jimenez leaves the ballpark. You can't put it on the board. Yes. We got a chance to do something real special. All right, sit back, relax, and strap it down. It's time for the White Sox Talk Podcast. Okay, Ryan McGuffey, Vinny Duper, we have a lot to get to here on the podcast. It's a kind of a gobbledygook of stuff in terms of players all of a sudden available and what the White Sox might do as a result of it. Let's begin with the White Sox names. Non-tendered, Carlos Rodon, Nomar Mazzara. I can't say I'm surprised, but it's definitely the turning of a page of two players who did not pan out in the way that the White Sox had hoped. Now, Rick Hahn did say, quote, we plan to stay in contact with both Nomar and Carlos and evaluate their possible fit with our club as we move forward through the off season. Something tells me they're going to try whatever they can make upgrades. (laughs) That's coach speak, Chuck. Yeah, I I know. I'm just trying to be as uh, objective as I can with the facts, but also letting you know, that's probably not going to happen. Anyway, uh, Vinny, your reaction to let's begin with Rodon and let's go Rodon, then go Mazzara and go from there. Yeah, I think like you said, both of these were were kind of expected. Uh, I mean, the Rodon one, we've been plotting out a uh, starting rotation for 2021, even even if they don't add anybody else, right? And, and obviously they're expected to go out and get somebody to put in that rotation. But even if they didn't, we were projecting out the five guys that were going to be part of that rotation next year. And Rodon was not a name that we were talking about. I mean, it's really kind of a sad story, his career with the White Sox here, especially the last few years, just – riddled with injuries significant ones that knocked him out for you know entire chunks of season at a time uh it, it's unfortunate because obviously you take a guy with the number three pick in the draft you're expecting him to be the ace of your staff at, at, at some point uh and that obviously didn't happen it couldn't happen because of the inability that uh Rhode had to stay healthy uh, here over the last few seasons. But even when he was healthy, there were some inconsistencies. And then uh, he obviously left things on a really sour note with those couple of uh, relief appearances at the end of, uh, of the end of the 2020 season. Uh, but yeah, I mean, we were looking ahead at the rotation of the future and some uh, cuts needed to be made with uh, the number of arms that are already vying for spots. And it didn't look like he was going to be one of them. It's not his fault. I, I, it's, it's unfortunate the way he goes out <clears throat> Uh, with those two bullpen appearances because he quite frankly shouldn't have been pitching in the, in those games, in those situations more specifically. But look, this is, this is a, like you mentioned, Vinny sad. It's a guy that you had high hopes for with the number three overall pick, but it never got better than 2015 and 2016 for Carlos Rodon ever. He threw 165 innings in 2016. That was his high watermark. After that, 69 and a third, 120 and two thirds, 34 and two thirds, seven and two thirds. It looked really promising at age 22 and 23. And that wipeout slider, I argued when it was at when it at it, when it was at its peak, was among the test ba- 10 best wipeout pitches in the game. And then he lost a little bit of that. Like he didn't have the wipeout slider when he came back either. So this is just a business decision more than anything else. This is a guy you had high hopes for to be. Look, he started on opening day. What was that? Was that 2019, Vinny? 2018 that he started on opening day in Kansas City? 
And this is right. 2019, 2018, 2018, two years ago, started on opening day. And it's just, you know, honestly, for a guy like Carlos Rodon, you, you hope it clicks and and resonates somewhere else, but it, this was the right decision. There's, there's just not a spot now in this rotation for Carlos Rodon because quite, you can't depend on him. And that's, it's unfortunate, but look, after seven years, this is a business decision. It was the right decision to let him go. It was the wrong decision one year later to acquire Nomar Mazzara. <laughs> uh, this was a big swing and a miss uh, for Rick Hahn in the front office. You know, we did a podcast almost a year ago from the winter meetings. Uh, the title of it was, What are the White Sox getting in Nomar Mazzara? Well, they got one home run. Granted, it was off Trevor Bauer, who won the Cy Young, but it was a humongous uh, failure of a trade. They gave up Steel Walker. We'll see what, if he becomes of anything. But, you know, everyone, I included, would, love, would have loved to have seen Nick Castellanos in right field. But um, I did believe there was some untapped potential there with Nomar Mazzara, so I understood the trade. But, uh, you know, he, that was something. I mean, he got a – tad better a tad better at the end of the year and maybe if this was a full season he would have been able to maybe figure something out but you know it, it was it was ugly pretty pretty much from start to finish for Mazzaro and it's too bad it ends like this yeah I mean that trade at the time you know maybe it could have worked he, the guy was a 20 homer hitter pretty much every year of his career in Texas and I think the big thing was when they got him, he was only 24 years old. Uh, I mean, this is, there was a reason for them to be talking about untapped potential because of how young that he, he was and remains. Uh, but, uh, you know, obviously he, he had that illness at the, at the start of the season, he missed the, the first week and a half of the season or so. Uh, and when he came back, he just was not even the guy that he was in Texas. I think Ray Khan said when they acquired him, you know, listen, because of what our lineup looks like, you know, if, if Mazzaro was just, 20 homers like he was in Texas, that would be okay because that would have done a good job with the, all the bats that were surrounding him in the lineup, but he came nowhere close to that uh, and was a huge disappointment this year. And so now with the White Sox being in win now mode, they got to fix right field and he's not going to be part of that fix. Uh, you know, if this was even a year ago, right. And, and the, the White Sox were not yet at that level of championship expectations. Maybe he gets another year, another full season to try and figure things out. But uh, the, the time, the time is now there's, there's, there's no more waiting for guys. It's time to win. And so he can't be yeah. a part of that. This is not Avi Garcia. No, no, <laughs> no. Quite <laughs> frankly, Avi Garcia was better than Nomar Mazar too. Oh so yeah. Definitely. Oh my God. Nomar yeah. Mazar had a 294 slugging percentage. 294. <laughs> He likes driving on 294. I don't – good for him. Not many people do. It's brutal. <laughs> I mean, 294, I don't care if it's 10 games, 42 games, 294, it's brutal. It was a swing and a miss. Look, I like Steel Walker, but you're not waiting around on Steel Walker anyway at this point to see how right. far down the line he's going to yeah, be. Let's be honest. That was a low-risk move. It's a wash. This trade's yeah. a wash. It's, it's one that – it was a low-risk, high-reward trade, and – the risk, you know, in this case outweighed the reward and you move on and there's a couple of big time bats available. And the one thing, you know, here's the one thing, you know, though, that you learned in the Nomar Mazzara struggling season of 2020 that Adam Engel took another step forward. And that worst case scenario on opening day, you walk into a, a gold glove caliber player and Adam Engel and can add a bat at the deadline or kind of wait to see how things go in those first two months. Like, that's worst-case scenario to me at this point. I still think they're going to bring in a bat, whether it's George Springer or somebody else, maybe on a one- or two-year deal. But it, it, no, no more bizarre. This is a big – this was easier than Carlos Rodon. Okay, so now it comes down to who is going to replace him in right field. And you mentioned Springer. What I love is that there's another name in the hat. Oh, yeah. There's another possibility. There's a couple, actually. Uh Kyle, uh, well, there's Kyle Schwarber, who is not going to play right field. Oh, no. We're going to get to Kyle Schwarber in a little bit. There's Chris Bryant, who was tendered a contract. He's a trade possibility. 
But uh, Eddie Rosario, what do you guys think of him? 29-year-old. He's mainly played left field, but he's played right. And, I mean, 32 homers, 109 RBIs in 2019. Projected, if he took his numbers from 2020, he would have hit 33 homers, 107 RBIs. He was batting cleanup for the Twins. He was due to make $10 million, so the Twins decided to turn the page. They've got some young guys in the minors that they feel can do the job instead of him. What do you think about Randy Rosario for right field for 2020, 2021, excuse me? I think it's something they should definitely consider. I mean, we talk about it all the time when it comes to the pitching side, right? That only one team's going to get Trevor Bauer and, and, and what you have to do as a backup plan. If you're not the team that gets Trevor Bauer, well, only one team's going to get George Springer. And so what's going to be the backup plan if you don't get George Springer? Well, all of a sudden Eddie Rosario is perhaps arguably the second or third best option when it comes to outfielders on the free agent market i mean if if marcelo zuna is going to be mostly a dh uh and and then you got michael brantley uh who who obviously we've talked about before doesn't really have a lot of experience in right field compared to to compared to left field eddie rosario might be kind of that next best option and and maybe he doesn't make people quite as excited as george springer does and that makes a lot of sense but i think the white Sox have seen what he's capable of doing over the last few years with him being in Minnesota. And just like we talk about when we talk about Nelson Cruz being a free agent, if you could take Eddie Rosario, put him on your team and take him off of the twins, you're making yourself even better positioned in the AL central. The guy crushes the AL central too. He's had 44 bombs against the Indians, Tigers and Royals and hits around 285. I mean, what, that's about, another, what about the White Sox? How does he do against the White Sox? He doesn't hit the White Sox. Well, that's, that's the thing that's, that's impressive. That's the most impressive. He hit 241. This is this is a stat line in his career against White Sox: 241, 283, 411. But in a 694 OPS, he has a he has a, a 900 OPS against the Indians, an 800 against the Tigers, and a bad one against the Royals. But my point is, you're getting a, a guy that you're familiar with. That's the one thing about Rosario. I personally, I'd shop elsewhere, but I would certainly come back and look in the. Uh, I'd look at that, uh, you know, the, the Black Friday bargain deals for Eddie Rosario. Let's be honest. I mean, he's he's out there. He didn't he get he didn't get tendered a job. So not that not that he's not going to have a hard time looking for a job. He's going to have plenty of suitors. But I, I he's not number one on my list. I'll put it that way. But, what number but is my he? point? Yeah, that and that that is the question though, right? Because I mean, I think a lot of people will turn their nose up at what isn't number one. I I think that Rosario can't be much farther down from number one though, right? I agree. I agree. To, for depends on who's list. If we're talking about the Ryan McGuffey list, it, my mine starts with pitching, and then I figure out right field. So, yeah. I mean, look, Rosario's in the very, very small conversation of, of, of people to fill that void. And if he, if you bring him in, he gets the job. And it's certainly he comes in probably. I mean, no more than a two-year deal. One year. I'm giving a one-year deal. Jack's giving him a one-year deal. One. You this is had, uh, this could have just had him for one year for nine million dollars, and nobody wanted him. This is one-year deal city. We are living. I mean, if you're not George Springer, Trevor Bauer, you're some guys will get two. I, I would say, I don't, as I say, we we have guys that are getting multi-year deals that are not that great. That like Mike Miner is not that great. We've had two guys that have gotten multi-year deals. Everybody else that signed has gotten one. So yeah. four guys have signed and two have signed multi-year deals. I mean, <laughs> no, there have been a lot of one-year deals. I'm 15 one-year deals I've noticed today. There's a lot of one-year deals. This is what I was expecting to happen. So, you know, maybe a team gives him, what, two for 13, two for 14? Like, that's what he's going to get. I mean, the Twins just said no to one-year $10 million for Eddie Rosario. I think that's... I don't know. So did every other team in baseball. I know he went through waivers. Every other team in baseball could have had him for that. And they, no, nobody did. Yeah. I mean, he doesn't walk. He doesn't get, if you're into these analytics, you're going to look at him and you're like, well, you know, he's doesn't have the great, the highest OPS. He's an okay outfielder. Um, yeah. Like that's what I'm like. He just, he's to me, he's a guy. I'll be honest with you, but I mean, he's, he's a better guy. guy than what you got. If you're the white Sox, <laughs> it's right an now. upgrade. It's a, it's an upgrade from what you got right now. I mean, honestly, like if you looked at Eddie Rosario's career numbers versus versus uh, our guy Nomar Mazzara, like they were trending in the very similar path. So, but the White Sox don't have Nomar Mazzara anymore. They have Adam Angle. 
I understand that. Yeah. But I'm just telling you that Nomar Mazzara has a 744 career OPS with that awful season he had, and Eddie Rosario is a 788 OPS. So let's not go out there and pretend that Eddie Rosario is the second coming of George Springer. Oh, I'm not saying guy. that. But I'm nobody's saying he, that. But I, only one. But only one team's getting the first coming of George Springer. I and so if that, that team's not the White Sox, they got to go get somebody. I don't disagree with you, but I again don't think right field is their number one priority. Their number one priority is starting pitching, in my opinion. And so, yeah, you make a play on George Springer, and if you don't get George Springer, you come back to right field. And if Eddie Rosario signs a two-year, thirteen million dollar deal with somebody else, I don't think the White Sox are going, oh, he's the one that got away. No. Save this save this audio, Chuck, because a year from now you could throw it in my face if he goes 35 and 114. <laughs> Which he could. So who would you rather have playing right field? Eddie Rosario or Jackie Bradley Jr.? Jackie Bradley Jr. Okay. So it's interesting. It's a good question. It's a good, it's question, a good question because a year ago, before 2020, you would never say Jackie Bradley Jr. You'd say, give me Eddie Rosario. Right. It's just funny how times, like a year, a season changes. Well, he had a good season in 2020. I mean, I... Well, for 60 games, right. But and so did Eddie Rosario. Eddie Rosario had a good 2020. That's what I'm saying. I'm talking about Eddie Rosario. Eddie Rosario oh, okay. had a good 2020. Well, yeah, both... Jackie Bradley Jr. had a good 2020. But he Here's wasn't good. Here's what I want out of right field. Okay. okay. This, like... George Springer, let's, I'm going to table George Springer because he's the... Yeah, we've covered him. We want him. And Yeah, and he's like he's the elite, and like he he's great all over the field, right? He's good offensively and defensively. You just don't need a stud offensive player at that position. You need a guy who can play. In my opinion, I want the best defender out there and a capable bat. A guy who can hit eighth in this, in this lineup. That, that should be a right fielder. That should so if you have right Bradley field. and Angles platooning in right field, you're good with that. I'm very good with that. Yeah. I'm very good with that. Yeah. If it's not, if it's not George Springer. Okay. <laughs> or Chris Bryant. I, I you've we didn't you know how yeah. I feel about Chris Bryant. Yeah. Like if you can get him for if you can take on that money and get him for, you know, you're not gonna give up a top tier prospect for Chris Bryant. No. At least the White Sox aren't. And somebody else does, you got Chris Bryant. Okay, let's move on to Kyle Schwarber because it turns out he's not the next Babe Ruth. Uh, listen, 2019, 38 homers, 92 RBIs, just in 2019. That's quite good. That is quite good. That is the left-handed smashing DH bat the White Sox have been looking for since Jim Tomey left. Now, in 2020, he batted 188 with 11 homers. He was going to make about $8 million. And the Cubs smartly said, no, we're not going to do that. Gordon Whitmire is saying the Cubs are not ruling out bringing him back. But like, what do you think about Schwarber coming to the Sox and being the DH for one year, one year deal? It, it sure seems like you're going to be able to get a lot of guys for cheap or relatively cheap, doesn't it? I mean, we're talking about one year deals. I mean, how many people are even hitting double digits? So the Cubs are saying no on $8 million. I mean, it, it's going to be, it's going to be a cheap sign if you get him. That being said, is he, he's no, there's no guarantee that he's going to be better than Andrew Vaughn. Right. I mean, uh, I, I think he will be better than Andrew Vaughn. Yeah. Andrew Vaughn has never seen a pitch above a single leg. Come on, Vinny. That's I'm fine, not saying... but Chuck just read his stats from last year, and Kyle Schwarber hit a buck 88. <laughs> yeah, I'm, not, I, I'm, gonna, I'm, I'm throwing 20. I'm not necessarily hanging on to 20. I mean, I'm not putting an asterisk next to Jose Abreu's MVP, but I'm not sitting here evaluating everybody's 2020 dismal run going, well, this guy's a 188 hitter. But I, it's fair. You, you're, That's you're fine, honest. because they, they, signed, they signed one of the most consistent power hitters in baseball to be their DH last winter, and he went out and hit a buck something this year for them, and everybody was freaking out. So it, that is something that could very well happen with Kyle Schwarber, it seems like, and that seems to like it could land the White Sox right back where they started. My preference, as I've said for two or three years, Michael Brantley. Get him on the south side. Yeah. He can be the DH. If yes. they don't get Michael Brantley, give me Kyle freaking Schwarber. <laughs> One-year deal for – Seven million. 
Like he was, yeah, he, I'd give, I'd give him eight million. The Cubs aren't. We're going to give him eight million. I'd give him eight million dollars. He can be the DH. I love him in this lineup. Love him in this lineup. Chuck's got eight million dollars just lying around that he's going to give to Cal Schwarber. Oh, the I White mean, Sox do. Yeah, <laughs> like I was. I mean, shit. I was going to give uh, Michael Brantley. I don't know, two years, twenty, one year, eight million. Kyle Schwarber, come on over to the South Side and mash. I would do it. I think there's plenty of upside. I'll give you that. I oh, mean, they, yeah. could, they could sign a ton of worse guys. That's for sure. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm interested to see what they think of Andrew Vaughn, because I, I let's put it this way. We've gotten your guys's uh, reaction. And I don't think that those are unreasonable. And I, but I think also that you could be looking at a guy that could be uh, the DH for most of the season. It just depends on what he does in spring I, training. I, look, Vinny, I, 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 there is zero scenario that I see Andrew Vaughn breaking the club. Breaking camp with the club. Well, I would agree with that, but that doesn't mean he can't come up three weeks later. Then that means you didn't. That means if that's the case, you didn't go out and sign a free or you did not sign a DH. But did you do? But yeah, okay. But maybe they didn't want to. That's what I'm saying. Like that's a lot to put on a guy like Andrew Vaughn. Like, and Rick Hans right. has said that he wants at the end of the year. He said they wanted a, a DH. I that's think. Correct. Look, I, I I tweeted this earlier about how I think it's kind of. Uh, it, it's 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 like serendip. I don't know if serendipitous is the right word, but it, it's baseball that the 2014 third overall pick and the fourth overall pick, both <laughs> drafted in Chicago, are now non-tendered on the same day, and probably could, you could make a more than valid argument that both are great fits on the other sides of town. Rodon to the Cubs and Schwarber to the White Sox. I love it. I love it. you know I don't, you want to know why I love it. The guy's played in the biggest games on the biggest stage, and he's performed. I mean, he's performed on the biggest stages. And it's like, you, we can sit here and evaluate Kyle Schwarber. There's definitely flaws in the guy, but he's exactly, they need a left hand. Like here, I'll put it this way. Who, like I have zero interest really in Jock Peterson at all in any scenario. I'd give me a Kyle Schwarber because he fills a void. Like he Although actually- I do like Jock Peterson in the playoffs. <laughs> yeah, but- I, <laughs> I've seen enough Kyle Schwarber's resume in the playoffs is pretty damn good. Cause I could, I could sit here off the top of my well, head and spit off memorable that moments. That was four years home. ago and three years ago. Well, well, here's a question. Here's a question. Okay. If the, if the White Sox sign Kyle Schwarber, who's the best, who's the best defensive left fielder on the team, <laughs> excluding Adam Engel. Kyle Schwarber. Be David Kaplan, by the way, I was talking Kyle to Schwarber. Kaplan about this. Kyle, Kyle Schwarber. Schwarber. It's easy. Yeah. yeah. It's not, it's actually not even a debate. Yeah, it's not. And but, I would agree with that, but I don't think I don't think they're moving a lawyer well, here, out of left field. Not, but you could spell a lawyer. You could okay. spell. I'm sorry to interrupt you, Guff, but I'm only I'm only interrupting you because I talked about this with Cap, and Cap said, "What you you know what? Go ahead, what you're going to say, because Cap, this is what Cap believed. Go ahead. I, I, I'm signing Kyle Schwarber as a free agent as a de- designated hitter. However. Uh-huh. The times that Aloy appears to need a day in left field. And yes. look, let's be, let's be honest. He's needed them. Kyle Schwarber is a great guy to plug and play there. He's the perfect guy. He is. You could have, you could put Schwarber in left field for half the games and Eloy for half the games and have them going back and forth between DH and left field. Now, and I think, I, like I think that. Kyle Schwarber also is a great fit for this team. He's a good, he's young still. He's young 28. with like a, 28. I know he's young with like a, a resume of like John Lester. So he, he would fit right in this clubhouse. He's a prankster. He's a great guy. He's great off the field. I'm he in. <laughs> when You're I saw the non turn him, I'm like, give me Kyle Schwarber. I mean, the last time we had a podcast and brought up a cub, this, you know, the whole, geez, there was a trail of gas that was drop a match and let it go. But look, people, don't look at the average, you know, look at what, look at the cumulative and where he fits in this team. Who are you? There's one DH available. There's one that you know what you're going to get from and it's Nelson Cruz and you're not signing Nelson Cruz. I'm worried about the Yankees going after Schwarber. There's a lot of teams that should be going after Kyle Schwarber. There are. Yeah. But Especially I, I the, Amer- the entire American League should be – the Tampa Bay Rays should be going after Kyle Schwarber. Yeah, but I'm just looking at the Yankees who are like – they have that, that short porch and right, and they're probably – Yeah, but they have on. like a team of designated hitters. The, the Tampa Bay Rays are like – if I were the Rays, I'd have already signed him. I love – he does strike out a lot, but I love his plate discipline. A lot of walks, tons of walks. I don't know, man. 
And where would you where would he where would he bat in this lineup? I'm, I'm, I'm eighth, seventh, eighth. Yeah. Oh my god, you're I mean, college over <laughs> batting eighth. Freaking my World right Series, here we come. The right fielder's hitting eighth, and Kyle Schwarber's hitting a few uh, slots not, ahead. Of him. Not if it's George Springer. Well, you know, by the way, I should take that back. <laughs> if they put Kyle Schwarber batting eighth, this, that doesn't mean the Sox are going to the World Series. I just, I'm just getting a little excited. Why am I so you excited are. about Kyle Schwarber? Well, so far, you wanted to sign every guy we've brought up, so you yep. are definitely excited. Well, that's that's par for the course with for our <laughs> I'm just my 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 thought process is there are more players in the pool for the White Sox to get. Yeah. This is this is and that's why this is all that's playing why, in the right hands of the White Sox. Yeah, and that's why that we have seen that's why the White Sox have been laying in the weeds. And a lot of teams have been for this moment, for this non-tender deadline to happen. And now, as you head into next weekend and what would be the winter meetings, you 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 now the big board is a little bit more complete, and you know a lot more about who's go, who's available and what you need to put together in order to acquire somebody else. Okay. So let's move on to Miguel Cairo and Frank Manichino. So Miguel Cairo, the White Sox new bench coach, spoke with the media earlier uh, on Wednesday. And Vinny, Vinny, actually, we're, we're going to run questions or run answers of your questions from both of these guys. You asked some good questions for once. No, I'm kidding. Uh, hey, even even a blind squirrel finds a nut, Chuck. Yes, yes. So here's your question: You asked Miguel Cairo, you know, what he learned from Tony Larusa during his playing days, and here's what he said: I learned how to win. That's something that, you know, he hate losing. I hate losing, and and something that you you learn with him is about how to be a professional first of uh, first of all, and uh, and how to win. You know, I think he's one one of the most prepared manager I ever been with, and uh, and you can tell by his record. You know, he don't he don't miss anything, and uh, he's he's way ahead of the another manager, the another team. He he managed the team before he managed the game before before the game happened. So it's 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 unbelievable how smart he is and how well prepared he is. All right, so Vinny, what do you think about Cairo's answer to your question? Well, first of all, he's got some good stuff to say. Miguel Cairo might be uh, a, a new candidate for uh, for a best quote on the coaching staff. Well, we right? lost Cooper, so that's true. That's true. I thought, I thought Coop had lost that title for a while, but <laughs> we heard her there. But uh, let's put it this way: I don't think anybody, with all the reaction to Tony Larusa's hiring, I don't think you'd find anybody who would tell you that they thought Tony Larusa was a bad manager, right? I mean, and so we're getting some of the we're getting some of the um, explanations as to why Tony La Russa has three world series rings on his fingers and why he's in the hall of fame. Yes. There's a lot of other things that are going on involving Tony La Russa that might or might not be cause for concern by the time the season actually starts. We'll see. Um, but you're having people who know him and people who have talked to him, people who are beginning to know him uh, telling you what the white Sox already knew when they hired him, which is this guy is a really good manager who knows how to manage a baseball game. Uh, and some of the things that Miguel Cairo had to say were definitely reflective of that. You can tell that Miguel Cairo, who, by the way, Miguel Cairo was not Albert Pujols, right? Miguel Cairo was only around Tony La Russa for, for a few, for a short while um, compared to some of those long-term Cardinals guys. Right. Uh, but he was able to pick up a lot from Tony La Russa in even that amount of time. I, I love this because a, it's new, right? I mean, it's not – you're not – like Joe McEwing's still on the staff, but he's a third base coach. This is – we talked about this a lot since Tony La Russa was named manager. It's kind of like that next in line. And you're kind of grooming a guy who possibly could be the heir apparent to Tony La Russa. And I like I, – I've read a lot about Miguel Cairo when it was rumored that he was going to be on the White Sox staff. The, the Yankees loved him. He was in the Yankees organization, Yankees organization. Everything you found from, from deep down into the system, people raved about Miguel Cairo. And a lot of the reason they raved about him was for because he had some of those traits of Tony La Russa. So I always feel like these are the these are definitely the the, the perfect type of bench coaches. And it, I don't know anything about Miguel Cabrera or Miguel Cabrera. I know a lot about Miguel Cabrera. He's really good. Uh, Miguel Cairo, in terms of what type of coach he's going to be for the White Sox, it's tough to sit here and say, I love this. But I like this type of hire for, for, for this type of manager and knowing that this is a sh that you are possibly 
setting up the next five to eight year window of your, of your team with a guy who could be there for the duration of it. So, so he played for besides Tony La Russa, I'm going through it right now. He played for Dusty Baker. He played for Charlie Manuel. He played for Joe Torrey. He played for, uh, who was this? And oh, Don Baylor. He played for uh, Larry Rothschild, by the way. <laughs> With the Roy, with the Rays in the early part of his career, but the he mentioned Rays. the Devil Rays. Yeah, he he mentioned in his press conference that you know he learned a lot from these guys, and as a utility player, in a way, because he's a utility player, he had to think like a utility player. In a way, also, he had to think like a manager. He thought like a coach. He thought of the chess game of baseball when he was playing. So he was kind of alluding to the fact that he's wired he's always been wired like a coach even when he was playing so those are the kind of guys that just see everything they don't they're not playing checkers they're playing chess on the field and so um i think that's a good match for for tony la russa and, and the type of guy that like his 17 year playing career just you know like and you look at his you look at his baseball reference page and it's like two years two years one year one year one year one year one year but look at who, who look at the teams that were acquiring him yeah, everyone, wanted them. Them. everyone wanted them. Everyone wanted them. Yeah. Everybody wanted them. That, that everyone wanted them. That especially the teams that you know the teams that are heading to the postseason. Yeah. yeah, let's see. Let's see who. I, oh, you could say all the. You could also say people didn't didn't want them because they kept trading them away. Um, He's a utility guy. That's kind of like they're never going to get three four year deals. So, but yeah. it's like the Cardinals, the Reds, and the Reds. Let's keep in mind they were good back back in the twenty. Like when he played at the end of his career with the Reds, they were really good at making the playoffs every year. Yeah, the Yankees. And I, I, and I'm looking at this. He kept becoming a free agent and teams kept signing him. This went on for eight years. I know. <laughs> this went on every off season. Miguel Cairo is becomes a free agent. And then someone's like, I'll take him. I'll take him. The Yankees took him twice. Cardinals, Mariners, Phillies, Reds. People I just get enough of Miguel Cairo. Yeah. I just like that. It's an, uh, it's an up and comer. I really, I, I, I it's, it's a, it's the type of hire that needed to be had on this staff at this time. So yeah. too was uh, the pitching coach and Ethan Katz, who we, talked, who we talked to on Tuesday. Uh, and, and he, he sounds like a guy that is getting just nothing but rave reviews from everybody. Obviously none more uh, than from Lucas Giolito who, uh, who worked with him in, in high school and ever since. Hoping to have Ethan Katz on the podcast in the near future. Okay. Now to Frank Manichino. Talk about sound bites. Yeah, oh, really. Oh, whoa. Do we have the drop of when Chuck asked, uh, would you sign Eddie Rosario? <laughs> oh, no. That was off camera. <laughs> Hello. Chuck's asking everybody. He's running up to people on the street, socially distanced, of Who course. Who would you but, put right field? Yeah. <laughs> He's taking a citywide survey of who should be the White Sox next right fielder. Well, we need someone in right field. <laughs> this is right true. now, it's, it's Adam Engel and Adam Engel. And I have no problem with Adam Engel, but oh, I was just saying, Adam Engel may take a little. <laughs> no, I mean I love Adam Engel, but listen, yeah, the White Sox. Are... Yeah, I know. Hey, right, Lauri, so... Lauri's back too. Remember? Oh God, Rick outlasted everybody, Ricky included. <laughs> Ricky's favorite player, longest tenured White Sox, Larry Garcia. Oh, by far, yeah. by far. The Alex so... Rios deal is totally worth it. <laughs> Where's Alex Rios today? Think about that. Watching Larry Garcia play baseball. Yeah, he's been out of the league for like 10 years. We still have Leary, though. Take that, Texas Rangers. All right, so Frank Manichino with maybe the quote of the offseason so far? I so think far. so. Again, from a Vinnie Duber question, I forgot what the question was. What was the I just, question? Oh, I just asked him about their about. I mean, you know, the team is setting some pretty obvious championship expectations. When you hire Tony Larusa, that's what you do. And so, you know, I asked him about that, and he seems excited. Roll tape, Frank Manichino with the quote of the off season. Boom. It is World Series or bust, you know, and that's the ad right attitude to have. You know, we have to go there. We have to make it. Our goal is to win it, and that's it. You know, pressure, no pressure, whatever it is, that's the goal. That's the goal for every major league team. You know, even though, even though some, of, some of them know, hey, we're not ready yet, but the bottom line is that's why you put the uniform on is to win the championship. So without a doubt, yes. All right, so that's a confident hitting coach right there. 
And it's a confident team. I mean, those guys were saying playoffs even shoot at the end of 2019, but uh, they're going to be hungry. The target's going to be on their backs and they are going to embrace it. And they've got, I think, you know, what sucks, here's what sucks. I'm just kind of going off on a tangent here. For the entire off season, if I say anything positive about Tony La Russa, I'm going to look like, like I'm carrying water for the organization or that I don't think that the DUI is a, is a serious problem. So I hate to have to say that, but I think they've got the right manager to lead this team and to the next level, taking all that other crap out of the equation. What do you think? They've got a manager that who has, who fits the bill of what they wanted. They wanted right. somebody who knows what, the, knows what it takes to take a team to the world series. He's done it three times. Obviously there were other people who have done it as well. Out no, there, take it be six they, times to the world series. Right. Right. And won it three times. Right. I'm, yeah. I'm, but you know, yes, AJ Hinch has done it. Yes. Alex Cora has done it. Tony La Russa has done it too. And he's done it three times. That's what the White Sox wanted. That's what the White Sox got. Is there more to the story? Yes. But there also is that as that one baseline fact. And there's a reason for this team to be excited, whether Tony La Russa is the manager or not, because of what they did last year, because of what they've been building toward. This collection of players should have the ha, should have the fan base and everyone in that organization excited. And I think you heard it today from the hitting coach. Players play, right? I'm not going to sit here and tell you I, I, I love Tony La Russa today on, on December 2nd as we tape this, because I didn't love it at the time. And at the time, I didn't even know about the, the checkered stuff. So I have been, I continue to say this, I'm, this, is, this is where I'm at. It's at this point, the, the next time that I truly can evaluate was it the right move is uh, on the field. Like that's the only time at this point that we could sit here and go, is it a good hire or a bad hire? It's you know, the fans didn't make the hire. We didn't make the hire. And if, if all of us did, it probably wouldn't have been Tony La Russa. I think that's pretty, I, that, that we know that. That doesn't mean it's the wrong hire. And I do like the coaching staff. I will say that. That encourages me. I love that Frank Menachino's back. But the next time I could truly evaluate and tell you if Tony La Russa was the right manager is when the Sox line up between the lines on April 1st. That's I, when I'm going to start evaluating Tony La Russa. I don't like how Tony La Russa was hired. I, I despise the fact that he has a second DUI situation. But what I was saying while Rick Renteria was the manager at the end of the year was this, and we'll go back to what happened with Carlos Rodon. My biggest problem was he was not putting his players in the best position to succeed. Right. What do we continue to hear? I'm not bringing this up. What do I continue to hear from people who know Tony La Russa, who have been on this podcast or have had press conferences saying it like Miguel Cairo did today? <clears throat> Tony La Russa puts his players in the best position to succeed. He has over a Hall of Fame career. He just hasn't done it in nine years. So again, I, you could, I, I, I think it's fair to say to have reservations. It's fair to have oh, reservations. You have that. That, that's your opinion, point. but this is my opinion. I agree. Like, but I, I, I think your opinion matters, but I'm just telling you that I think most, I think a lot of people feel I, I, there's some people who are pissed off and are never going to get over it. And that's going to have to change, or you're just going to be really pissed off the whole time. And that's, that's not a good way to live, but this isn't a therapeutic podcast. Not this one. This, I just think we've had some of those before we've had, we'll have more, trust me, but I just, it's impossible at this point. Listen to the players. Listen to what they're saying. That's why I keep saying at the end of the day, it's all of the players play. And if the Tony Roos is going to make bad bullpen decisions, like every manager, he may, he's going to make great ones. But, if, but if some guy strikes out with the bases loaded or gives up a, a game tying or game winning hit in the ninth, that's not on Tony La Russa at all. The yeah. Time. But I, I, and that you, you can argue, well, how many wins or games does a manager, uh, yeah, how many wins I, or losses can a manager give you? I, I'll say, yeah, but I'll, I'll tell you this about Tony La Russa. There will never be a game three wild card series scenario with Tony La Russa. That was a shit show that should have never happened. It's just true. It was ugly from the start and it just spiraled out of control. And it was a guy, it got Ricky fired. It was, it was, yeah. it was a nail in the coffin the moment he pulled Dane Dunning. I am choosing to, for the moment, compartmentalize the whole DUI character stuff because there's nothing I can do about that. 
All right. That's just yeah. there. It's just there. So I'm just evaluating him as a manager right now. And yeah, it's been nine years. Something tells me that when the season begins, I'm going to be watching White Sox baseball and I'm not going to be pulling my hair out over decisions that are made <laughs> like I have in the last couple of years. I think it's going to be a much more, um, I mean, we're, you're, we're going to second guess because that's. I, I agree with what you're saying here, Chuck. I, that, that, I will buy that 100%. I, I will, I will. <laughs> well, you preach it and I'll pay for that one. That exact yeah. lesson that you lineups. Just, I mean, some of the lineup construction, I was just like, yeah. uh, like, what are you, yeah. what are we doing here? James, when McCann the game starts at seven or five, when the game starts, I, I'm going to have very little doubt about yeah. the guy in the dugout. I'll yeah. say that. Yeah. Like yeah, it's the, the, the three and a half hours or whatever it's going to be. I, I'm okay with that. Yeah. So how about we end the podcast on that? Or should we end no, it on something just... better? What else do you want to end it on? What do you got? Uh, I'm out of stuff. How about we say this? <laughs> you want to make a prediction? Do any of the names that we brought up end up on the White Sox in this podcast? Or do you want to rank it? Rosario? Of the names that's, that we name, who's the most likely to be a White yes. Sox? Rosario, okay. Schwarber. Eh, is that what basically just went through with those two guys? Bradley, Bradley Jr. Springer. Or Michael Brandt. I, I'm oh, so we're just opening up to all the outfielders now. No, okay. I, I'm going to table Springer because that, that's that's a different. He's a different animal and it didn't come with the nut. I'm to me the best fit and the and, and the most likely. I'll just say that I think it's Kyle Schwarber. Uh, Kyle Schwarber can stay in Chicago. He can still be loved here and just switch. I mean, it, what a great opportunity for him to continue his career with a team that basically is starting out like his Cubs did when he came up. I think it's, it's a great one-year op- opportunity, and then you let you allow Andrew Vaughn to mature again. And maybe Vinny, you're right. Maybe Andrew Vaughn does come up in July or something, and kind of takes the reins from Kyle Schwarber because it's a one-year deal. But I just think he makes the most sense. He's left-handed. He's, he truly could. He truly is a DH fit. And he look, he's a 30 home run hitter. It's, it's a good fit. Uh, I mean, I said on our one of our prediction podcasts that we've had so far this offseason that I thought George Springer was going to end up on the south side, and I think he still makes a ton of sense. I mean, it's just, I, you know, he, he seems like such a perfect fit for what they need. They're thinking long-term. That would make sense. You bring up the fact, like we talked about last time, that Blake Snell could be acquired, and those things seem to mesh perfectly, too, as much of a home run as that would be in the offseason. And so maybe Schwarber is likely because he's a cheap – option to pair with one or more of those guys at DH after you go out and you spend a ton of money on someone who's a bigger name. Uh, it makes sense, but you know what, if they go the pitching route, if they sign Trevor Bauer, then someone like Eddie Rosario looks good in right field, right? Because then the finances line up a little bit more that way. So I can see all of those things happening because of the needs that they have. I think Rosario, I think I'm a little warmer on Rosario certainly than Guff is. Um, but I'm not as cold on Schwarber as I might've made it seem earlier. So I definitely think that he- if they go the Springer route, which I think they would like to, cause it makes a lot of sense. Schwarber does make some sense following. All right. Him. Best case scenario. It is George Springer and right field. Yeah. Most realistic is in my opinion, Eddie Rosario is in right field for a one-year deal and Kyle Schwarber is the DH for a one-year deal? You get them both. You're saying you get, get them, both. them both. Okay, so who do they? Your get, pitcher is a who stuff. do they get to pitch? Chuck? Yes, because yes. if they, and, and they if trade they don't for a get, pitcher, they okay, trade for a pitcher. If, if they don't get, if they don't add a, a top flight pitcher to those two guys, that's no, that's no, an because that's not going to make a lot of people happy. I think they do the trade for a pitcher. I think they're yeah, trading because here's the thing. Like, okay, they were going to try and spend a lot of money on Springer. They don't get them. Okay. So now we got to figure out right field and DH and there's still the question about revenues for 2021. All right, well, we can spend some money, but we're not going to go crazy. Let's just get us through 2021 because we feel like, like we can win one year deal and we can even overpay for one year. Like, okay, Eddie Rosario, yeah. we'll give you the $10 million. You play right field and right. Kyle Schwarber, we'll give you $10 million DH for us for a year. Boom. We have a chance to win in 2021. I just, I come back to this. I come back to this, no matter how much we might disagree on how um, effective they would be. If the season started tomorrow, they have someone that 
can play DH. They have someone that can be in the starting who's, rotation. Who's the DH? Vaughn. No way. Uh, <laughs> but they have somebody they can put there. They don't have don't an know. everyday right fielder right now. I'm not trying to rip on Adam Angle. Yeah, they they do. don't have an everyday right fielder no, right I now. I think you're wrong. You got to flip. They have a right fielder. They don't have a DH. You're not put, now, I'm going to go back to this. You are not putting Andrew Vaughn in the position to succeed. You're telling him, okay, you know what? You don't know that. He might be, he might be really good. He might. <laughs> he might be, but I don't want to bank my entire season on Andrew Vaughn being my DH. And you want to I mean, bank your entire season on Adam Angle playing right field? If no, I, I, I want to. I, I want to get an upgrade over there well, too. Right. I'm, but I'm just saying, of those three positions, to me, right field is the one that doesn't have an internal fix. That's my thought. That's my opinion. All right. Well, yeah. I, I'll be honest with you. There aren't too many outfielders in, the, in their minor league system. Right no. Now. Well, there's this a is, lot of them, but they they're not, yeah, they're I think not ready. The, yeah. I think this, of is, this is not good. Well, they got to they gotta find somebody. They they have got to find somebody because if Adam Allen goes down, <laughs> Luis Gonzalez, come on we, up. We, we need help. <laughs> we need help. So, all right, that's going to be a wrap for this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast, brought to you by Wintrust, your home for White Sox checking with free ATMs nationwide. Go to the special White Sox webpage, www.wintrust.com slash Sox. Uh, scheduled to have another podcast for Friday. Nice guest who's going to break down the free agent landscape for the White Sox for you. You'll want to tune in for that. Hawk Harrelson, take it away. Thanks, our Chuck. And this edition of the White Sox Talk Podcast is over.